All right, so this is a uh, panel uh, f on this topic of uh, exploration in RL. Um, I should say, you know, this has been a great event and uh, I've learned a lot, but it shows how much interest there is in this topic. Um, I personally think of uh, exploration as a uh, distinctive, as something that makes uh, our RL different from other areas of machine learning. Um, one anecdote on that front, uh, Harry Clough, who in some ways was a mentor to uh, uh, Andy Bartow and Rich Sutton, apparently used to say that uh, RL's different from other areas of machine learning in that RL is about maximization where other areas are about minimization. And what he meant by that was RL uh, is an area of learning that takes a uh, blue sky perspective where an agent has to go out and figure out just how much it can accomplish. Whereas in supervised learning, you're trying to minimize error and in other topics involving learning for control at the time, uh, agents were trying to learn how to get the system to behave in a way it wanted the system to behave, where, where RL is about uh, seeking the unknown, right? And uh, in my interpretation of that, uh, exploration is really a critical piece of that because exploration is really about how to go out and find that. Um, so exploration, as we've seen today, is a uh, uh, quite an active area of inquiry, and uh, this has fueled uh, a variety of ideas and opinions about the topic. Uh, there are many approaches, as we saw today, for uh, exploration in RL, and some researchers in RL feel that uh, it's really critical that we get exploration right. Without doing that, we won't be able to do RL effectively, while others feel that um, you know you have to do some exploration in RL, but it doesn't really matter that much exactly how you do it. Uh, there's gonna be so much data that doing the right exploration to get the right data may not be critical in the future. So to offer some perspective on these matters, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists today. Uh, we have, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, with us uh, Marlos Machado from Alberta and DeepMind. Uh, Ian Osvin from DeepMind, Finale Valez Doshi from Harvard, and Martha White from Alberta. So I hope to, uh, uh, I'll be moderating this, and I hope uh, with, uh, with such uh, great panelists, we're, we're gonna have an event even more exciting than uh, the World Cup final. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope for a bad game. <laughs> So I'll uh, pose a few questions uh, to get them talking and, uh, sh and, 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 and uh, for them to share some ideas that will uh, uh, um, illuminate our thinking on this. My first question is, um, are advances in exploration critical to RL? So we'll go in the alphabetical order here, starting with uh, Marlos. Uh, so, uh, I think that, I mean, definitely is in the sense that up to today, when we actually think about the systems being deployed in reinforcement learning, at the end we are all using Epsilon Grady as the policy to search. We keep, we, we always propose new algorithms and these algorithms have nice back bounds and they have nice regrets, but when we actually see it, how people deploy them, it's random. And I don't think that, it's very hard to advocate that random is the right way of doing exploration. Um, yes, John? I, I agree. I, John is saying that contextual bandits don't use epsilon greedy. I, I have a hard time placing contextual bandits as a full reinforcement learning problem. So I, sometimes I feel it's all like almost two separate fields. Uh, but yeah, so I think that it, it is important because of that. But on the other hand, I also that think that we have to start considering about other things that I think it's hopeless to expect that our algorithms are going to explore the whole environment by themselves without extra feedback because as far as I know, we don't know any living being or intelligent being on Earth that actually does that without support. 
that uh, that explores the whole environment or that's able to accomplish a task without, I don't know, parents or a teacher or something like that. Okay, um, thanks a lot. So I guess we are speaking to a bit of, you know, a bit of the converted here. So probably everyone's gonna say that exploration is important. I guess I'll pick up on some things that, um, that Marlo said. First he said, I think it was like, oh, when people use reinforcement learning in practice. I'm pretty sure nobody really uses reinforcement learning in practice, um, <laughs> or not very much. But I contend that if someone wanted to, no, sure, but I think that following up on John's thing is that if someone wanted to solve random 10 state MDPs, you would use you know, PSRL or UCRL, and that would be better than Epsilon Greedy. And if you have a contextual bandit problem, you, know, you can use one of John's algorithms or several, there are really good algorithms. But we actually don't have really good algorithms for the general RL problem, and that's part of the reason that nobody uses them. And you can bet that like, if Google had to solve random 100 state MDPs, yeah, if that was a business problem, they'd use one of these algorithms and it would make money. It wouldn't be a hard sell. Um, so I think that, so anyway, that, that's a fir the first thing. Um, and I guess the other thing is like, people shouldn't, so I guess in terms of the RL problem, at least how, how I you know, tried to frame it, is that exploration definitely is a key part of RL. You know, that's almost a, a tenet of what is part of RL. That doesn't mean that it's important to solve all problems. So, and I think that's one of the things, like do you necessarily need exploration to make self-driving cars? Mm, probably not. Do you need exploration to solve Montezuma's Revenge? Again, probably not. You can get demonstrations or whatever. But I think it's hard to argue that you really have an intelligent system until you have something that reasons about learning and about getting good data. And I think that we do ourselves a bit of a disservice in thinking that it's all about sparse rewards, learning from scratch. Actually, the interesting parts of exploration are when you do have prior knowledge. And in not all problems does being greedy lead you to the right information. And I think if we made a really good algorithm for exploration, then people would be desperate to use it. So <clears throat> I agree, um, obviously, we're at an exploration workshop. But uh, for me, like the, the blue sky thing about RL, or the thing that really excites me about RL is like learning quickly, or learning from small amounts of data. And for that, you know, exploration is obviously essential, because if you waste your data, um, what, you know, learning things that you already know, then you're not going to get anywhere. Um, and in terms of the real world problems, so my main application area is in healthcare. So mostly my work is actually in an observational setting and it's off policy. But the thing that I aspire to is to be able to guide um, clinical trials. Like that's what I'm working with my collaborators to get towards. And you know, in terms of expensive samples, those are very expensive samples. And so I think that uh, getting a good exploration policy of how to design those trials absolutely essential for us to be able to get good treatment policies from very small amounts of data. <laughs> okay, well, and you guys have said most of what, what I would mostly want to say, but you kind of have answered this question in two ways, and there seems to be kind of two answers to this question, which is, uh, is it actually important as part of the reinforced learning problem? Like, should we care about exploration? I think that's sort of a resounding yes. And also, is there still really important open problems or have we solved a lot of exploration? And I think the answer to that was also a resounding no. We definitely have many things that we have to solve in exploration. Um, so I, I agree, the exploration is a very important problem. I think there's no doubt that we need to solve it. Maybe I'll just highlight a few things that I think are sort of open, like why we haven't solved exploration and reinforcement learning. And we sort of start listing the things that we haven't solved. I think it's kind of clear that we have to do a lot more. So some of the the things that I think we are really open is, how do we explore different time scales? I'm not sure to try to look at the audience, I'm looking at my panelists. Anyway, uh, how do we explore different time scales? So right now, we have some mechanisms to explore, but we're not as good at asking, you know, how do I decide what, uh, at an abstract time scale, like how am I gonna get to docking in my charger versus exactly how I'm gonna take steps right now? Um, I think safe exploration is something that's really open. Uh, I think another one is that we don't exactly know what mechanisms are needed for exploration. So some people use planning a lot for exploration. Exploration, do we need optimism? So what are all the different mechanisms we need to consider in exploration? Uh, and I think the next question is gonna be what, some of the things that I think is the most important, which is how do we actually formulate our exploration problems? I think even that we haven't narrowed down as a community. And what are we actually trying to test when we're testing exploration? I actually say one last thing to respond to what Ian said. I think there is some kind of view that maybe all of our RL agents are always gonna have to be online, and therefore all of them will always, all have to do a little bit of exploration. I'm just gonna pose that as a possibility.
thank you. Uh, you actually touched on uh, the next question I wanted to ask, which was how should we assess exploration methods and what would it mean to solve exploration? Uh, you want to start? Should I go again? Yep. Uh, so I, I honestly think that this is a very hard question to ask because personally I'm not satisfied with the methods that we have. Uh, even the theoretical analysis, it seems weak in the sense that I don't expect I don't expect an agent to visit a polynomial number of times the, out of a function of the number of states and actions. It's like, we clearly don't do that as humans. It's like, when you think about all possible states, we're not trying to visit everywhere to get an estimate. Um, and somehow I think that, uh, one thing that I feel it's really lacking is the fact of, general, uh, is to encode, be able to encode this notion of generalization when we're talking about exploration. It's like, oh, I've been to similar places, so I know that I don't have to actually go there. And actually now I can quote John's uh, work, that he, his work with Nanjiang and, and when they're introducing the concept of Bellman ranks, that I think that this is a step towards that. It's like, okay, let's see how, when you have these different environments, how we can actually see that, okay, this, these states are similar and then, and then maybe I don't have to explore because no one goes around looking at the ceiling to see if there is a million dollars there, but somehow it feels that we're expecting this from our agents because otherwise they're not exploring that part of the state space. And we have a lot of priors and, and things that, this is the type of thing that I feel it's missing when we are talking about exploration. It's like we have this very blowy sky perspective that the agent's going to do everything from scratch, but maybe we, we should have some more priors or should be able to incorporate notions like generalization on, on, on this evaluation of our agents. Yeah. Uh, so I probably, solving exploration would probably come in one of two ways for me and maybe I'm probably jumping ahead of what Finale would say here. But one, like a really great success of it, would be if you had decision, um, you know, dynamic experimenting systems that really impacted the world and brought a lot of value. So if it got to the stage where your RL system was what you, or, you know, this medical trial is really important, and because of that, we're not gonna waste it with like a doctor picking who we're gonna trial it on, we're gonna use this RL system because that does better exploration. Okay, that would be like a huge success. Okay, how do you get to that point? Well, maybe you could look at something like, um, you know, multi-arm bandit with independent arms. And I would say that that is mostly solved to like a pretty deep degree. People have an analysis of it, you know, the upper and lower bounds of what's attainable, very good algorithms, you know, Gittin's index hits, you know, optimality and then other, other notions. And, you know, moving from, from independent arm bandits, I'd say, you know, linear bandits are also pretty well understood exploration in a tabular setting is becoming extremely well understood and you know we can we can push our understanding out from that side as well through analysis through understanding the issues at play and a sort of that that should help us um, push the the boundaries of efficient exploration so I guess one a challenge problem for people and I guess John you know please look at John's work and I guess some of the work that that um, <laughs> that we've been doing as well, but you know, are, can you get a result similar to linear bandits, but for reinforcement learning? Is it possible, let's, I say, I've got a value function, it lies in some d-dimensional linear space, can I get an algorithm that learns in d root t regret? That, that would be pretty cool. Cool. Yeah, so I, I think Ian summarized a lot of what I was going to say. So I, I just want to reiterate, um, I, I think as the metric, the, you know, expected regrets are really, I mean, they, they make sense to me. Uh, the question is kind of what, are, uh, what else are you conditioning on in terms of like how do we quantify notions of generalization and prior knowledge so that we are putting things on the same footing and being able to separate, you know, what is the benefit of the new representation versus what is the benefit of the exploration strategy and these sorts of things. I think um, if we're trying to tease apart our algorithms, these are really important pieces. Uh, one other thing I will add is that I think there, you, you mentioned safe um, uh, uh, RL or safe exploration. I think especially in the off policy regime, I think there's a, a number of different questions or related questions on how to um, suggest exploratory strategies where notions of coverage are also really important. 
Um, so some of the work that we've been doing is to not just suggest an exploration strategy or just one thing, because that might not be the right one. And you know, a clinician might be able to look at it and say, this makes absolutely no sense because you learned it due to some confounder or something like that. But how can we present the clinician with many options for exploration and have them choose from them? So that I think there's some interesting questions and metrics in there as well that are kind of outside of just the, the standard expected regret metric. Okay, I'm just going to reiterate the question. The question is, how do we assess exploration, and what does it mean for it to be solved? Um, so to me, this is sort of the same as the question of, when do we know that we have AI? Like, it's to that level of difficulty. And I think the answer to that question is usually something like, I'll know it when I see it. So I think we have sort of had the same problem in exploration, where it isn't exactly obvious what it means to have solved exploration or even to have good exploration. But I think we all want some kind of intelligent, directed exploration. The agent should be intentionally trying to go find information in its world. <laughs> And so I think you can kind of start listing criteria about what that might look like, even if it's not a complete set of criteria. So for me, some of the criteria are, um, just to remind myself, that the behavior should be directed and not random. So I think that was a recurring theme throughout today. Uh, another one is that the agent should learn to explore. So you'd hope after it gets more and more experience, it actually gets better at exploring, not just that it gets better at whatever task it's trying to solve. Um, and uh, another one is that the agent should actually be able to explore selectively. So it shouldn't have to exhaustively explore everything. We should have some, the agent should have some mechanism to decide, I'm not going to explore that, and I'm going to explore this. And I can imagine there's many other criteria for what intelligent director behavior would be, but I think we'll never really pin down what it means to solve exploration. Thank you. Um, this sort of takes us right into our next, the next question I wanted to ask, and let's go re in reverse order this time. We'll start with Martha. Sure. Uh, but what do you think are the promising uh, directions for uh, accomplishing these things you mentioned? Great. Actually, I didn't sort of answer the second part, which is how do we assess? And I think that's an important direction for actually making it so that we can develop better exploration algorithms. Because if we sort of think about how are we going to assess these, then it's going to direct our algorithm development. So I think one important thing that we haven't really done a whole lot is thinking a little bit more about having uh, like a lifelong learning setting or a setting where our agent has actual curricula. So it starts off by solving maybe easier things. Maybe it's actuators are actually restricted or the set of things they can do are restricted, like a baby. It's always easy to go back to the real world. And then as time passes, it starts to tackle harder and harder problems. So right now, we don't structure our actual experiments or problems that our agents are facing in a way that I think is very realistic, and then it doesn't allow us to drive our algorithms towards that. So I, I do think we need to sort of reconsider our assessment to then drive what we should be doing. I think exploration algorithms under curricula will be very different from exploration algorithms from scratch with absolutely no restrictions whatsoever. Um, OK, but then some promising directions. I think one thing that is should be more explored is thinking a little bit more about how the representation and exploration go together. So right now, we uh, I have either had tabular settings, which actually tabular can be, can be pretty helpful for exploration, um, but it doesn't allow you to generalize. And then we've had some nice linear function approximators that actually did make exploration quite a bit easier. And now we've moved on to learning these big, complicated neural networks. Uh, and it's, I think, really hard for an agent to latch on and actually get any good estimates anywhere. So I think we have to step back and say, what kinds of properties do our representations need to have for good exploration? Um, I'll just maybe mention one other one I think is important. Uh, I think another one that would actually be pretty useful would be to also start incorporating more model-based strategies. I know we already do a lot of model-based reinforced learning in terms of the theory, but I think there's a lot less when we are in the function approximation setting to say, how can I learn an approximate model and get that to help me update my value functions uh, more, more efficiently, being more data efficient. I'll leave it at that. I think that's two minutes or so. Thanks, Finale. Cool. Okay, so um, I'll, so I guess your main theme was uh, representation learning, which I fully agree with. Um, I, I, another theme that was really common today was just this notion of like temporal, ex temporally extended planning in one way or another. That we're not trying to try to optimize something in the short term, but creating these sub goals or, or things like that. Um, and also, what kind of biases do we want to um, put into our algorithms to again kind of going to the curriculum learning. And then I'll just add, you know, reflecting the, the thing that I mentioned about off-policy evaluation or off-policy settings in the past is that um, in, in those settings, I, I think some, you know, what are, the, what are the necessary algorithms to provide the right sort of coverage? And there might be sort of interesting human interaction components here as well, like how do you take advantage of human feedback 
um, which might be cheaper than getting some of the full on data from like actually running a clinical trial and doing exploration in these kind of, kind of in-between settings, I, I think is quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so I guess I should have said this on the last thing, but I just wanted to kind of remind, or at least in my view, the expiration, we kind of already know what the optimal expiration thing is, and it is basically, well, if you agree with expected regret, or it, it is to be Bayes optimal, and we also know that that's not possible, you know, even for simple, <laughs> the computational demands are simply too high. So really, this whole game is about the statistical versus computational trade-off. And so in that way, depending on your problem, you're gonna have different sort of sweet spots that you hit, you know, and it might be, I guess so in terms of promising things, I'd probably put stuff like along the alpha zero, you know, alpha go line, those are doing these gigantic, incredibly powerful tree search things. Well, you know, in certain contexts, incorporating more prior knowledge there, trying to be more like Bayes optimal. Well, yeah, that, that's a really promising thing and it's pretty amazing. I guess um, I'm very interested in an area uh, inspired by stuff like Thompson sampling because I think that that might hit another kind of sweet spot. Um, Thompson sampling is saying randomly choose something according to the probability you think it's optimal. I think that's really nice because the two requirements you have to have for that are one, you can draw a sample from your beliefs, and two, that if you knew what it was, you'd be able to plan well. And kind of, if you can't do either of those things, your learning was doomed to begin with, right? I mean, so things along that line, you know, I think are a really interesting idea. And I, I think that the signs are that in simple settings, this is a really interesting principle and it just needs a bit more work to extend it to richer domains. Thanks, Marlos. Um, yeah, uh, I'm excited a lot of, uh, about a lot of this stuff that was mentioned earlier. So I, de I definitely think that representation learning and exploration should be put together and we actually start to be able to formalize and see how we do this. And it's not only when we have function approximation, but what if we are learning a representation along the way and how, how do we use that? Um, another thing that I'm interested that Marta mentioned is the fact that is to have kind of a constructivist approach when we are talking our, about our agents, that our agents start with a very limited knowledge and as they keep growing and they keep improving their knowledge, they actually are more capable of like, even exploring better. And in that sense, one, one topic that I'm particularly interested at is when you have uh, temporal abstractions. So when you have, let's say in reinforcement learning, for example, we generally formalize this in terms of options, but it's that we want to have these agents explore at different time scales and being able to, to operate in the environment, not necessarily at the, the level of always going up or left or down, but maybe say that, oh, maybe I wanna go to that room or maybe I wanna climb the stairs. And it's not about, do I wanna climb the next step of the stair, but it's just like, okay, I'm going to climb all these stairs. And I think that this directed behavior that Ian calls often deep exploration, I think that's, that's essential for our agents because this detrain hurts and one of the ways that I think this could be done that is not f being so explored right now is using these different time scales to, to actually incorporate this, this type of behavior. Let me ask a question. Um, so one of the themes uh, of your comments, Marlos, was that there's something unrealistic about the way uh, many exploration schemes we currently use are operating, where they have to sort of go and try everything out, right? And this may be related to representations and generalization and stuff, but, but when I think about how humans learn, humans often don't learn by trying something out. You know, they learn by taking a course or going to the library and reading a book about the thing, right? Um, do you think that should be an important element of effective exploration? And if so, how does it fit into uh, our algorithmic frameworks? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I think it should be a part of it. I think that if, as we start to keep trying to get more complex behaviors, we, we might be needing these priors and these courses or, or these parents go, uh, helping you out. And it's somehow related to what Ian also said, that it's like, Exploration is not when we are doing from scratch, but often it's like, okay, now that we have this, I don't know, let's say you have intermediate rewards and you have some positive reinforcement along the way. It's like, how do you explore at that point that you're not going too far from what you expect the agent should be at, but it's still acquiring knowledge that is going to be useful 
useful in the future. And yeah, uh, yeah. I've, to be honest, I've, it seems that it's almost orthogonal right now in the field, that it's like if you're using human demonstrations or if you're using a curriculum, it seems that people are not so concerned about the exploration and I would like to see these two things being more connected. Uh, it would be interesting to see that. I have something of a... I have something of a suggestion for how maybe we can incorporate that information because it is hard to think about our algorithms as they learn action values or value functions that really starting to experience the thing. It's hard to imagine how do you incorporate knowledge from a book into your action value. But it seems like this in between where we actually incorporate planning, it seems more possible you could actually define a model that somehow takes some of this different type of information that's not exactly grounded in your immediate sensory information and then your model could incorporate some of this information and then you could do planning let's say with dino style planning to then propagate that information into you, you say your value functions will let you make decisions fast um, i don't exactly know how we would incorporate that information into a model it just seems more feasible than trying to incorporate it into something like a value function let, let me just comment something uh, it's that uh, i think that also it depends how we interpret the, all these things that we might want to see ourselves, so it's like intelligent agents as uh, agents that are in a re very rich environment, they are l able to learn uh, a lot of things. And then you can say that the books and the courses, they are part of this rich environment, and maybe what we actually need to be able to do is to go after this knowledge and, and actually have agents that are able to learn that much in such a rich environment that I think that clearly our agents don't have now. I don't think that there is any environment that an agent can just go and read a book and try to acquire knowledge from that. I do think it's important, though, to keep separate the notion of like benefit that comes from transfer or meta learning or whatever, uh, the external source of information um, and, and stuff that comes from the algorithm. Because I, I think it's very easy to conflate all these things, and then you just don't, you don't know where your benefits are coming from. And I, I, as I said before, I love to see that quantified. And so you can have algorithms that maybe in some cases you start from scratch. And, and you, so you mentioned like the statistical computational trade-off and there's also the data trade-off. In some cases, maybe you're willing to take the data trade-off and, and learn from scratch, right? In other cases, you may not be willing to take the data trade-off. And it would be great to be able to quantify, you know, what those data trade-offs looks like precisely. All right, so um, at this point, I wanted to uh, solicit questions from the audience. Is there anybody who would like to probe our uh, panel up here? Hey, uh, thanks for the interesting discussion. Um, can you speak a bit as to how hierarchical style RL might uh, interplay with exploration? Do you think that's a um, useful orthogonal direction, or do you think it is um, something that might be necessary for good exploration over long horizons? You mentioned it briefly. But I'll just give a pithy answer, like a short one. Uh, I think the abstractions are really important, and that sort of goes back into our representation. And if we have good representations of our state or also temporal abstractions for our actions, um, those representations are going to be extremely important. But I'll let someone else say something about it. John? So uh, I wanted to comment on the contextual decision process versus reinforcement thing that Marlo has brought up. I think it's an artificial distinction to break them apart. And I think it's actually fairly important that the community try to not do that. The reason why I think is because there's, there's kind of a, a slippery slope argument. Right? Like one step is, is, is contextual bandits, two steps is reinforcement learning. It seems like it's, it's artificial to say that because you can use contextual bandit techniques to even solve a two-step problem. So um, certainly contextual bandits is a special case of reinforcement learning. I think you should regard that as a piece of reinforcement learning. And when you do that, there's an immediate benefit because people are doing reinforcement learning in practice right now that you can point to, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not proud of some of these, but certainly there's like all the ad engines in the world which are doing some kind of reinforcement learning effectively. Everyone at least is doing exploration. I know many of them are. Um, there's many other applications which have the same flavor, some which are, uh, I'm more proud of, like so for example, uh, adaptive clinical trials are a thing that people are actually trying to work towards right now. And uh, there have been a number of uh, kind of like healthy habits intervention systems which are doing bandits or contextual bandits style uh, optimization. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that the settings are, are obviously compatible. There's, there's obviously there's, there's a different communities effect coming in, right? Because it was sort of three people who were doing bandits for a long time. 
and reinforcement learning people who were kind of poo-pooing bandits for a long time. But um, but the, these are settings which are obviously, it's, it's obviously just a, a limiting case of the other. And I think that it, it, it's, it's, it's stronger to think of it as all together because what's gonna happen in practice in the real world is you know we'll do a bunch of one-step things and then we'll do two-step things and then five-step things and that's just the way it's going to work, right? I mean, people aren't going to leap to doing sudden many, many uh, hundred-step, a thousand-step reinforcement learning in, in practice. There, there's going to be a build-up towards things, and we want to you want to keep you, you want to include the the limiting point where the production actually happens inside the domain. That's an interesting point. Do you have a question? Nope, that's it. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, how long do you think we are away from an agent that learns from demonstrations without receiving those demonstrations um, and treating them in a different way? Like without receiving them through a specific channel or putting them into the replay buffer, the agent just walks around in the world and sees another agent do something and learns from that. Was the question clear? So, well, okay. I, I, maybe I have a question. Actually, I wasn't completely clear to me. So, are you saying that it, it, you, you can't distinguish between your actions and other actions, or that you uh, observe other actions and you don't want to treat them? Like, what do you mean by not yeah. not treating them differently? Hello. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you in learning from demonstrations right now, you usually have some specific algorithm that treats um, experience that the agent sees in the world differently from. Uh, you know, specific demonstrations, even third party, maybe third person view demonstrations. Um, but I'm saying there's an agent working, uh, walking around in the world and it just observes another agent doing a task that might be relevant and it can make that connection. So, so this you, is a perception question? Like, you, I, yeah. like presumably you treat observing other people do stuff differently than yeah, when exactly. it's internally I, to I'm you. I'm having a hard time. As a human. Um, I, I, think, I think I get the question. I think I've seen some papers doing that with Atari, learning Atari priors of playing video games from YouTube videos. I think that's with Nando de Freitas and some other people. So I guess I would count that as an example of that. Right, I think. Right. Right. Okay, maybe we should move on to. Well, I'll, let me just answer one thing. I think that's a really interesting point that for, for learning from demonstration, that right now we do think of it as maybe a mechanism to avoid exploration. I don't know anything about learning from demonstration. I'm just going to say that right up front. But it, again, maybe this is one of those situations where we formulated our problem so that it is a little difficult to imagine moving away from that problem, but that the solution is not necessarily that difficult, where again, our agent would have to learn how to learn from demonstration. You know, there, it's not that, uh, that agents start off, let's say intelligent agents that we know start off just immediately learning from demonstrations around them. There's this long learning phase, and then we start learning how to actually recognize what are other agents and how do we take information from those. Um, but. So the, I think also if you're in the regime where you're willing to learn from other agents, you're, you're kind of, okay, you're, you're, you can either call it a cheat or a feature, right? But you're already in a regime where you're trying to take advantage of other information. I, I, I'm, I guess I'm not sure why you would like strap your hand behind your back and, and not allow the agent to 
kind of already be aware that there are other agents? Like in, in terms of information that you might build in, I, I, I think there's lots of interesting questions. Like once you see that, identify this other agent behaving, how do you combine that information with your information in a way that's productive and not just imitation learning? and use that for you know, exploration or defining sub-goals and strategies and these sort of things. I think there's tons of cool questions there, but it's just unclear to me why you would like, want to not tell the agent that other agents exist in the world if they do. Yeah. One more question here from uh, Ryota. Hi, uh, thank, uh, thank you for your discussion. Um, my question is, do you think randomness or stochasticity is essential for exploration? So my th feeling that it is useful but somehow people are using it in a, in a bad way. So what is your thought? I, I just have a one off thought, I guess. I think randomness, we, we as computer scientists and maybe machine learning people kind of like randomness. There's a feeling of robustness to randomness. So I think it's definitely possible that our agents could use randomness in a directed way. Like maybe you reach a state and you say, I'm deciding right now to take a random action. Um, my philosophical view against random agent behavior is not that it ch takes random actions, but that we encode as a mechanism that its exploration mechanism is random. But if it directly chose to be random, that could actually be a robust strategy. Um, and, and I also think, I, I think that randomness would be useful, uh, but mainly when we are thinking about different time scales. Because when you are thinking about just, I don't know, a grid world, then it can go up, down, left, and right. Uh, what we often see randomly is that first, when you look at the, the analysis, it's like it's go the, the, the area that you're going to cover is going to be fairly small in expectation. And then there is a, this underlying assumption saying that, okay, but what if I, I visit that transition again and there is a small probability and there, there's a lot of assumptions that should justify that, that behavior. But I want to claim that most of the time we, we actually want to commit to something and not just go forward and then the immediate, very immediate next time step say, oh, now I'm going backwards because maybe there is something there. It's like, I think that's the part that hurts and that we are trying to get rid of. So I think that um, if, you, if you accept that one of the biggest challenges in exploration is this trade-off of statistical, and by that I really mean, yeah, data and computational efficiency, I mean, there are quite a lot of algorithms or settings in computer science where randomization can offer computational savings, sort of average case complexity. And I don't, I, f I find it quite likely or believable that a similar situation could show up with some algorithms in this setting too. So judicious use of randomness, I think, likely could be useful. Great, that's a great point that uh, randomness can play a role uh, in computational efficiency. I wanted to sort of have a follow-on question here. Um, this pertains to um, a position taken by Ian and others earlier that perhaps the right framing of the exploration problem is you know, to find a Bayes optimal policy, right? So in a sense, if you had infinite computation, you could find a Bayes optimal policy and go with that. But, um, uh, well, well, with the Bayes optimal policy, you'd get decisions that are a deterministic function of your belief state, right? But speaking to the point that uh, Martha made earlier, that there's something about randomization that helps with robustness, right? Thinking about that through this lens of Bayes optimal policy, you know, a Bayes optimal policy is based on knowledge of what your horizon is. Either you're optimizing for a specific horizon or a specific discount factor, something like that, right? If you want a policy that is robust to what that discount factor is or what that horizon is, a policy that sort of works well uh, for a range of those, right? That might have to be uh, random. Do you have any thoughts on that? So I think it depends on how much you- And let me add to that, sir. And, and given that, um, is this notion of Bayes optimal sort of the right way to think about exploration? So I, 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 yes, so, so that gets to my, what I was gonna say. I think it depends on what we can quantify. So if we um, aren't sure what the time horizon is, but we can put a distribution over it, or we're not sure what the discount factor is, but we can put a distribution over it, then again, we have a problem that we can find a Bayes optimal solution to that will be deterministic, but you can, um, you know, totally imagine that any reasonable situation you're gonna use some sort of randomness um, for a computational reason. But I think what you're hinting at is that, you know, usually we make up these priors and they're priors of convenience and they don't really mean anything in the real world. And what do we do then? And, and then I think randomness can help and also 
trying to figure out what our flexible model classes are, are going to be really essential because we're not going to be able to specify these things accurately. I guess then, yeah, I also agree with that. And despite having, you know, put forward, I guess, this Bayes optimality as sort of a nice guiding principle or coherent framework for goals, I think it's I, at least for me, I think it's pretty clear that this is not really a practical strategy. It's more of like a principle and like even, even the task of like uh, eliciting your own priors or writing that down would just be impossible, I think, for anything reasonable. So we're going to need to be more practical. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks for the interesting discussion. Um, my sense is that the majority of um, kind of approaches that we saw today um, were um, either model-based or kind of value function-based approaches. Um, there's been some interesting work um, in policy gradient and uh, questions around how to explore there. So for example, exploring in policy space. I was just wondering if uh, the panel thought there are interesting kind of developments there and how they relate to the uh, other work that was discussed today. I, to be honest, I don't know much about what's going on in the, uh, on that specific uh, approach. But but I think that one thing that I heard was that that it stuck with me is that when you look at uh, uh, this policy gradient methods, so for example, naming one trust region policy optimization because it's in the name, they have this assumption that you're not going to deviate a lot from the policy that you currently are at because otherwise it's not much stable. So. As far as I can tell, uh, I think that the policy gradient methods sometimes do have a harder time exploring because of these implicit assumptions what, of how close the policy that you're going to estimate and the next one you're going to, to get. I also agree that I know less about exploration in the policy gradient space. But as far as the loss of the methods I've seen are, are usually about injecting noise into the policy or taking whatever your best estimate is now, maybe putting some distributions over it. Um, and I think intuitively, maybe it's a little easier for us to use some of the principles we know and love from, say, bandits, some things like optimism, when we have action value estimates, because it, we're saying, this is how good I think this action and this action is, and I can sort of quantify my confidence in that. And I think it's a little, easy, a little harder to say exactly what that looks like for the policy. Of course, then we have things like critics and stuff, so maybe we could do something there. But uh, as far as I can tell, a lot of the exploration work and thinking about different exploration mechanisms have been model-based strategies. and. Uh, action value strategies. But I'd, be, I'd be happy to be told wrong if someone else knows. So I, I think that one of the reasons why people normally look at the model-based or um, value-based is because uh, policies are kind of, well, okay, now I'm just going to try to be a bit more contentious here, but I guess policies are more like black box. And when you, when you go to policy world, I don't know if you can really do that much better than black boxes. And I think value functions are really special things about RL because there are ways of summarizing knowledge and properties of the MDP, which would otherwise potentially be exponential <coughs> complexity down to this one number. And I guess then you could say a model is a special type of value function, but this making this predictive thing about, you know, you maybe need S of them for an S-dimensional state. So at black box, you mean that you're optimizing in a space where you're not taking advantage of any of the structure of your problem? Yes, that's what I mean. And that, you know, in some situations, you know, maybe you can work out, oh, the, the space of optimal policies is in some sense small, and so I'll search in this space, I'll do really well, that'll be great. And, you know, I think policy-based regularization also, you know, really important, really useful. But I, I would say that that's probably why, because you miss out on one of the magical things about RL, which is like Bellman error and TD learning value functions. Somebody else have a question here? Anyone else? Hi, uh, great discussion. Uh, I have a question about measurement. Um, uh, I think we all agree that to do good science, we need uh, sort of good metrics, and this was mentioned uh, earlier or um, touched on. Um, is it taking analogy with something like uh, image recognition, what MNIST, CIFAR, ImageNet have done, is it worthwhile if we sort of, uh, as a community or a sub-community of RL, can kind of agree on, on what constitutes um, a hard exploration problem and maybe uh, sort of construct 
uh, a grid world or, so, or something that, that we can all agree on or something like this. I see many different versions of very similar um, environments that are sort of um, different in subtle ways and, and this can confuse issues. Sure, I'll say something about that. Um, I, mean, I definitely care about having scientific experiments in our reinforced learning papers, but there's sort of two different purposes sometimes to our domains. Sometimes we'd like to do benchmarkings where we just like to say, here's a bunch of hard tasks. Um, I'd just like to see how my algorithm performs across these tasks. And there maybe standardization is what you're looking for. You'd like to have these benchmark problems. But often when we want to say, I'd like to understand this property of my algorithm, it isn't a bad idea to step back and say, I'm going to design a particular problem to highlight I sorry, a particular domain to highlight this property, and it doesn't matter that no one else has actually used that domain before. So sometimes for, for very geared scientific exploration, making up new problems is good, and sometimes benchmarking, I think, can also be sort of dangerous, because then you, you sort of forget to step back and say, what are the properties I'm getting here, rather you just choose to run across all these benchmarks and see if your number was bigger than the other number. Um, nonetheless, I think challenge problems can play a, a really important role. Atari, for example, is sort of turning a little bit more into a benchmark, but it has also played the role of being a challenge problem where it's really driven questions about how do we, has driven lots of questions, I don't have to summarize them. So it has played a good role as a challenge problem. So I didn't really answer your question, how do we make good benchmarks? Because I, I, I'm not sure if there is an in-between between challenge problems and very specialized domains that tell us something about our problem. I'm still open to, I'm not sure if I think we should have benchmarks or not. One thing that I would like, love to see is that, so we have these benchmark domains and they're complicated in so many ways. Um, and, and then we have on the, the other end of the spectrum, as you mentioned, problems that are made to be hard in only one way. So we can really demonstrate the benefit on there. I, I'd like to, so we, are, we have collections of benchmarks. We don't necessarily collect our special cases. And one thing that I think could be very informative is if we had a collection of our special cases and then we run you know, the, the various algorithms against all the special cases. Because in the paper, you always show the special case that shows off the specific problem you were trying to solve. But how well does it do on all the other specific problems that other people were trying to solve? And I think that could maybe be very informative. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a really great idea, and especially if someone made it open source and easy to run, which you know is never really going to happen. But it would be great. You could see a little like scorecard, baseball card. How how does your algorithm do? But um, in terms of assessment, I would say like there's three types of assessment I think are really good, and going. This isn't a particular order, but one of them is doing like analysis, and you know, not for the sake of just getting an equation in your paper. That's really bad. Don't do that but an analysis that helps you understand the, the algorithm and what's going on, what's going on with the problem, that's great. I like the little simple examples that you know, highlight one or many things, but cleanly, that's really good. And then also for exploration, actually you know, just doing real problems that you wanna do, because maybe what we think about exploration, oh, Ian may, did a chain problem, oh, he thinks that's really important. Turns out it's completely irrelevant, never shows up in any real problems. We've gotta have real problems you know, that ground us because otherwise we could just totally go off on the wrong course. And so I think it's actually, although you know, I think Rich Sutton said earlier, I saw it retweeted, oh, my number is higher than yours, it's the lowest form of science. But I actually think that the my number is higher than yours has been one of the greatest successes of machine learning and that revolution. So you know, I think that also needs to continue. Uh, one last question, if anybody, if anybody has one. While Ben, while Ben is trying to look for someone else, let, let me say something. Is that I, I think that the, yeah, I don't like the approach, my number is higher than yours. Uh, and I think that because it starts to get, to, to start, it's like, you stop asking the questions or, or the principles and it starts to be about, oh, can I fine tune this to get, to get specific results that, that are, are a bit, that are going to beat the other baseline. And I don't think that it's, I like what you help, you know, you say it's like science is not a competitive sport where we have to actually beat someone else with a higher number or a smaller number. It's like, it's about understanding a, a phenomenon and being able to explain it. And, and I think that the problem with benchmarks a lot of the times is that there are implicit assumptions that are not being made, that are being made and that we don't acknowledge. For example, are we going to come up with the benchmarks of exploration in Atari, for example, and then we all have this, 
same games like Montezuma's Revenge, Pitfall, which I agree it's way harder than Montezuma's Revenge. Uh, and then we're going to say that, okay, this is what we're going to use as a proxy for exploration now. Uh, are, we in uh, are we incorporating the concept of, I don't know how many frames we can actually use? Because we are talking about a mismatch that Emma was showing. It's about, hey, I can do 50 episodes, or instead I can do 2,000 or 200 million frames. And how much does this benchmark incorporate this, or how much we're just expecting to say that, oh, at the end I got 5,000 points, and yay, I win, you know? And a lot of times people overlook these details. And I think that these are the details that matter, mainly when you're talking about exploration and sample efficiency. Thanks, I think that's it. And uh, let's uh, thank our panelists. This was uh, really great.